It's a new week, a new Monday, new day of work for, well, new week of work for those who have a job. That's a good thing if you have a job because not everyone has a job in these current times. And we're seeing that with this new week, new protests are seeming like they are bubbling up from different parts in the Caribbean. It's the fourth Caribbean island, the third Caribbean, Caricom Island, sorry, to have protests. That would be Antigua. They have had some protests over the weekend and you're seeing in Trinidad some people are speaking you're hearing some people talking about I, I saw a post where someone said after the incident over in St. Vin, Vincent someone said the St. Vincentians are awake but the Trinidadians are sleeping so I guess their suggestion in that is that the St. Vincentians knew what they were doing when they attacked their prime minister and that I guess they suggest that that was a good thing and the protests in St. Vincent followed the protests that already happened in Martinique and then the protests in Antigua followed that protest in St. Vincent but there was another island that had protests I believe even before all of them and that would be Cuba although they are not a part of CARICOM they are just as much a part of the Caribbean if you look over on my Caribbean map here Cuba is very present in the Caribbean and they had protests and the US, we are seeing some reactions to the protests even in Cuba just as there are reactions to the protests within the CARICOM proper region and I think that these things when it comes to both the citizens and the politicians the authorities, the government, the leaders, those in charge both sides, these situations, these protests are at moments when they're very crucial. We, we are at turning points right now. According to how the government and authorities react to the protests, you may see an, an acceleration or a bringing down of the temperature of these protests according to the reaction of the government and the authorities. That's my belief. And according to what information goes out and the leaders of these protests according to how they react to the reactions of the government ministers, we could see some of these things getting kind of out of control. And that's not an ideal for us. In Trinidad, as I said, the I believe the last two videos I did last week, I said that one of the reasons I believe in Trinidad we won't see any of these protests, at least not quite yet, is because of our economic situation. And at least as it, as it stands, it seems to bear out with that. That... In Trinidad, we aren't seeing the same the same level of unrest being stood up with these things. Now, one part of the reason may very well be that Trinidad isn't heading towards the government side of the mandates and that the Trinidad government is kind of, in my book, they are being politically smart, but I'm not sure if that strategy would work in the long run for the country. They are trying to get into, legislative, into the legislative side of the mandating vaccines. They are trying to leave it up to the businesses. And the businesses are seeing trouble with this. I saw a video released with a business, a specific business, where the owner was laying down the law to his employees there. And that was shared all about Facebook. And you saw the reactions that that got. But in my book, I understand the private side of a mandatory vaccine. If I have a private business, it may be well within my right to determine who can enter my compound and in what condition you can enter in. Now, there may be, there may be qualifications there based on the previously signed contracts of the employment. And if the previously signed contracts of employment don't have something allowing for that, it may be more difficult for a business to do it. But I believe one of the things that he, the business owner, said they were doing to encourage the vaccination had to do with bonuses. And if the bonuses are all based on the owners or the, the runners, the managers of this business, the, the bonus is all based on when they choose and when they will to give you it, then you could understand that they can withhold that bonus, possibly without any legal ramifications to it. We'll see how that shapes out for the business owners. But the government isn't, at least not yet, the government isn't getting into that. They're leaving the business owners to handle it. So let's get into the articles. If you haven't clicked that like button yet, feel free to click that like button now. And do drop a comment. Tell me what you think about the current going on, goings on. Is it goings on? I believe that is it. Goings on in the Caribbean. And where do you see this leading the Caribbean eventually? So Mr. Watson Duke, everyone's favorite union leader, 
is saying let people choose to be vaccinated or not. There aren't many things that me and Mr. Duke agree on, but I actually kind of agree on this. I think that the government would be threat would be threading into very dangerous water to attempt to take the mandatory vaccines as many other countries are doing they are doing it but our government may be may be threading into dangerous water to attempt to go through that top down mandatory side president of the national trade union center of trinidad and tobago watson duke says he's not supporting a call by a business organization for mandatory covid vac covid 19 vaccine laws duke said the government has far adopted has so far adopted a pseudo position on the issue while the unions and business chambers will meet on tuesday to discuss it duke said there have been meetings with the chambers with no conclusion they continue to hold this fictitious view that the unvaccinated are a threat to the vaccinated and therefore they only want vaccinated people in their workplace to me it is a way of creating the biggest industrial rift in this country now that's one of the biggest questions I see constantly. Are the unvaccinated at risk to the vaccinated? The question, the question has a complicated answer. The simple answer to me, if someone asks that and they're trying to force a yes or no answer from me, I still wouldn't give that answer to be very honest. Because for the most part, the answer is no. If you are vaccinated, the, the selling point, and if you are trying to sell the vaccine to someone, Please listen to this. The selling point of the vaccine, the main selling point as it stands right now, is personal. Personally, it will decrease your risk of getting the virus. Personally, if you do get the virus still, because you can still get the virus through breakthrough cases, if you still do get the virus, you wouldn't get it as badly. And if you do even get it badly, the chances of dying are very much decreased if you are vaccinated. That's the main selling point of the vaccine. Now, the, there is a side where there could be some risk based on the, the, the availability of the virus to, to be spread among the population. So if there's a large number of, of unvaccinated people, the virus will be able to spin and spread among that population very quickly. And the faster the virus spreads, the, it increases the chances that mutations may occur. And if I am vaccinated and my chances of getting the, the virus has decreased greatly, I, I stand a very low chance of getting the virus. I still do stand a chance of getting the virus. And if more unvaccinated people exist in and around me, the chance of me being exposed to the virus would be increased because the chance of an unvaccinated person getting the virus is, is higher than a vaccinated person. So if you were to think about it like this, if you have a group of 10 people and five people in the group are vaccinated, five people in the group are unvaccinated, and the chances are... The five vaccinated can still get it. The five unvaccinated can still get it. But the chances of the unvaccinated getting it are much higher than the vaccinated. If you have this group mixing, the chances of these unvaccinated people getting the virus is high. So they would increase the chances now of a vaccinated person coming into contact with the virus. But if a group was of, the, of 10 fully vaccinated people, the chances of them getting the virus is much lower because everyone stands a lower chance of getting the virus. So everyone stands a lower chance of exposing each other to this virus. So there is a, a slight threat posed by the unvaccinated to the vaccinated. But I think in the phrasing many business owners use to attempt to convince their employees to become vaccinated, some of them some of them aren't using correct science to do that and just as many people are up in arms about the misinformation and disinformation on the anti-vaccine side i think it may be wise to point out some of the misinformation and disinformation even on the pro-vaccine side because some of that when it is proven to be false makes it seem like all the entire issue of vaccines is a, is a, is an in total is is a total falsehood and totally a lie coming out from the authorities or whoever you think it's coming out from. The, the EOC chairman, the that's the Equal Opportunities Commission, that's the, the organization in Trinidad that would be in charge of looking out for these eventualities, the discrimination, the pressuring from the employers. 
In a separate inter interview, Ian Roach, chairman of the EOC, said COVID-19 created an unprecedented dilemma and there is no hard and fast approach to address it. In some cases, the individual's right is trumped by that of the majority. In some cases, discrimination is permitted. Not blatant discrimination like race or things like that, but in certain instances, discrimination is allowed. Now, you see that statement there? I don't know if I agree with that. I'd have to I'd have to see what what those specific situations are because when you have any situation where you could have circumstances where the individual's rights are superseded by the group's rights and where discrimination can happen based on group group characteristics the problem with that I understand the logic of it that's kind of obvious obviously at some point in time the group may be more important than an individual. But my problem is, who chooses that? And how do we get to that choice? Who do we give the permission to have the authority to say, okay, this specific individual, their rights would be put down, and this specific group, their rights will be raised up. And is it in a democracy? The, the general lean in a democracy is we go towards the side where Wherever the majority is, we tend to lean towards their view. The majority has the say on whose rights sees, sees supremacy. As, ooh, that's quite a hot button topic. But whose rights sees supremacy. But that leads to some seriously evil things. You cannot leave the majority to determine the rights of the minority. But then similarly, you cannot leave the minority to determine the rights of the majority. So... That, that statement by the Equal Opportunities Chairman, I am curious to see exactly how that would be done in real life. Because there are people who are going to refuse this vaccine. That's for sure. And I don't think, as I, as I said before, our, in Trinidad and Tobago, our retail sector, our economy allows us to, to, to do the, the pressure side from... To do the, the pocket pressure as it were. You, you feel it in your pocket. The, the, the impetus to get vaccinated is felt in the pocket. And that's because of our economic situation. But the retail, with the retail sector reopening, I think that would help with some of those pressures. But even the retail sector already said that not all of their businesses would be able to reopen. So to the people who remain unemployed, that decreases their motivation to become vaccinated right there. And because of that, when we saw the when we saw the union leader what's nuke speaking about he's not following along with some sectors view on mandatory vaccine what he was speaking about was a tobago group tobago stakeholders government must make vaccinations mandatory and this was coming from the tobago hoteliers association i believe yes that would be the tobago hotel and tourism association vice president she was quoted as saying that she endorses mandatory vaccinations coming from the government just as they are doing in many other countries now i'd like to point out to her that in many of those other countries where they are doing that mandatory vaccine there is a blowback to be felt because of it the main the main starting point i would say look at france if you see the size of some of those crowds i i have my views and my views kind of fluctuate in and out of how we see this mandatory business but i could agree with some on the more conspiratorial side when you look at the level of protests in france and you look at the level of media coverage you get from it you're understanding that some of these media houses are attempting they are attempting to handle the population they are attempting to make sure that this this sentiment doesn't catch on because you aren't seeing some of these crowds some of these crowds in France are enormous. And when you're talking about the government implementing the mandated vaccines, you have to understand that that may very well be a consequence of it. Now, I understand on the hotelier's side because in Tobago, the Coco Reef Hotel has closed down. Well, temporarily closed down at least. And that's because the bars are closed, the rivers are closed, the beaches are closed. With, with all that closed, 
the tourism sector in Tobago is really not as appealing. Less people would be going to Tobago. And if less people go to Tobago, then the, the purpose for a hotel becomes null and void. So obviously the hotel loses money. They cannot afford to pay people if they aren't getting any money coming in. So the hotel temporarily closed down, closes down. And I understand that. But when you have hotels closing down and businesses closing down, and then you're trying to mandate the vaccine. Are you sure that you would have the impetus to get these people to get this vaccine? Or would you end up with a situation like what happened in Antigua? Protests erupt in third Caribbean country. Protests have spread to a third Caribbean country. By the way, when they say third, they're talking about CARICOM country because protests already erupted in Cuba before all of this. Protests have erupted in a third Caribbean country with the police being forced to use tear gas to disperse demonstrators in Antigua and Barbuda's capital, St. John's. Now, that's... that's that tear gas is already seeing some condemnation with the some of the planners of the protests and some of the politicians on their side condemning the use of tear gas on peaceful protesters. Now, I think some of the protests that happened around the world and especially in the United States last year would be setting up for this year some of the protests that we are going to be seeing. And some of the people that said some foolishness regarding the protests last year and because you had your own personal biases and your own personal views on these protests you allowed yourself to go beyond what was logical and i think some of these people may now see some of this returning to them when you're talking about certain things in regards to protests some of these same lines that were used about the protests last year may be used again with the peaceful protesters protesting what they view as oppression and then you're going to see that these security services are coming in there to stop this peaceful protest and you're seeing the tear gas and the optics of that just isn't going to look good and Personally, I think when you look at human behavior, if you have with human behavior, people pushing back against this protest, according to how heavily the, the government does it, as I said before, with this tear gas and in St. Vincent, they had search, they, they had searches and raids of a lot of opposition members' homes after the, the Bassett incident with their prime minister. One woman was already arrested for it, but I believe it was 10 homes of opposition members and radio hosts and journalists were searched based on this. And I think the, the, one of the opposition leaders, the, a, co, a former Coast Guard general, said that he believes this is, a dangerous, this is a dangerous footing that the government is placing itself on in St. Vincent. And I actually agree with him. The quote that he had is this. Democracy is not a giant conifer, a big mango tree, but a gentle flower that those with big heavy boots are waiting to stamp upon and crush beneath their feet. And when that is done, all of us suffer, he said. Now, I agree with him to some extent. The nature of democracy needs a softer touch because democracy needs the approval of the people you are governing. Democracy works on the consent of the governed. Remember that phrase, the consent of the governed. And in order to get that consent, you cannot force consent. Any one of us who knows anything, especially if you're talking about the, the, gender, the gender interrelation side and the abuse side, when you're thinking about consent, consent requires convincing someone. And if you're trying to pressure someone too much to convince them, then that still reverses from consent and goes into coercion. So to, to have a democracy and get this vaccine to just about everyone and still maintain that democratic ideal is a difficult thing. And I think the Caribbean is in the middle of trying to maneuver some of this. And I hope I hope that we'll do so successfully because our own stability would be dependent on this. What do you think? Drop, drop that comment, tell me what do you think. If you aren't subscribed yet, please do click that subscribe button and click the notification bell and I'll see you tomorrow for the next video. Can you feel the music, feel the music rising with the time?